Okay, so let's begin the electric power industry economics and finance course. Um, module one is going to talk about a overview or give you an overview of the electric utility industry. As I said in my introduction, it's really important that you understand how we got to where we are so you can understand the movement forward and what those changes mean to each of the industry participants. The agenda for this module, history of the electric utility industry, as I just stated. Um, we're going to talk about whether electricity is a product or a service, why and how electric utilities are regulated, an overview of the New York State Public Service Commission, and an overview of the industry participants. So I'd like to begin by giving you an overview of the industry participants. We're going to talk in much more detail about their role as we move through this module. The first are the energy supply companies. These are um, competitive energy supply companies. The New York State Independent System Operator. The New York Power Authority. The New York State Public Service Commission. Generators. The electric customers. Transmission owners and distribution owners. The electric utility industry is a unique industry in that the product must be generated and delivered along the path of least resistance at the exact moment that it's needed. So think about it generated, moved at the exact moment that it's needed. So that creates its own challenges but also creates a lot of opportunities. So the electric utility industry that we know today all began with Edison's creation of the long lasting light bulb in 1879. But it wasn't just about the light bulb, it was about people's desire to have the light bulb and how were we going to get the electricity to all of those light bulbs. So as light bulbs became more and more popular, we needed the infrastructure to be able to support those light bulbs. So in 1880, Edison created the Edison Electric Illuminating Company which built the first coal-fired electric generating plant in New York City. Why is this important? Well, this generating plant had the four key elements of the modern electric system, reliable central generation, efficient distribution, they're able to efficiently get the generation to the um, residents, and successful end use, the light bulb. And they also did it for a competitive price. So the industry continued to evolve. It went from decentralized to centralized. At the end of the 1880s, there were numerous small decentralized utilities. Think about it, little utilities like Pearl Street Station that's shown here, electric poles, and then to end use. But generation was only three, four, five blocks away. It didn't go very far. So they had to have a lot of little plants, decentralized generation. But in 1886, hydroelectric development of Niagara Falls was the first practice of placing generations, generating stations far from the consumption center. So Buffalo was 20 miles from Niagara Falls. This began the concept of centralized generation, right? Centralized, very large plants producing a lot of power and able to transmit them over very long distances. This is important because as we go through this course, you'll see we're almost coming full circle and through the REV proceeding, which we'll talk about, they're actually looking at some of the benefits of decentralized generation. And we'll learn a lot about that later on. So initially, many small generating stations tran transmitting energy just a few blocks with different owners, then consolidation, mergers and acquisitions per se. Then in the mid-1930s, the federal government began to regulate private power. So they were owners of mostly hydro, low cost power, which were sent to preferential customers. So mergers and acquisitions continued. And what happened was electric utilities were owning different utilities across state lines. It became very difficult to regulate them. One state could not ensure that, the, that one utility was double counting, collecting the same cost across multiple states. So along came the Public Utility Holding Company Act of 1935, better known in industry as PUCA. 
It came about, like I said, because one holding company could own many small utilities in different states. This act allowed the state's ability to regulate their activities. Um, the PU increased state's authority over the rates and prices of that utility within its state boundaries. So the industry continued to grow. Consumers demanded more electricity, more power plants were built, mergers and acquisitions continued on. Then there was an event that changed the industry. On November 9th, 1965 was the first Northeast blackout. It was caused by human error. Someone had set a transmission line capacity threshold too low. So it affected parts of Ontario, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, and Vermont. You can see the satellite map that shows all the lights across the United States, except that pocket in the red circle. That's where the blackout was. For up to 13 hours, uh, 30 million people were affected in about 80,000 square miles. Also, if you're a movie buff, the movie Where Were You When the Lights Went Out is a 1968 American comedy with Doris Day, and in there it shows this event. So in response to the Northeast blackout, the New York Power Pool was created. Now the New York Power Pool is a predecessor to the NISO, the New York Independent System Operator. One of my colleagues is going to be presenting the NISO. He's an unbelievably smart, enthusiastic gentleman that you're going to really enjoy. And I'm not even going to begin, begin to pretend to be an expert on what I believe is a very complicated model, but Wes will make sure that you understand it and make it as easy as possible to understand. So I'm just going to give you an overview of what the New York Power Pool is and what the NISO is. So the New York Power Pool was created in 1969 in response to the first Northeast, Northeast blackout. So after the blackout, they found that, that an overseeing organization was necessary to attempt to prevent any other occurrence of a widespread blackout. Um, in addition, they facilitate a, an automatic wholesale power market between the utilities that are members of the pool. Now, the New York Power Pool model became obsolete as utilities were entering into more and more bilateral power sale agreements with each other in, the util in other utilities. So on December 1st, 1999, it was transfer it transferred the operational control to the NISO. And as I said, um, Wes will go in much more detail because it's an extremely complicated model um, that he'll, he'll do a much, much better job at than I possibly could explaining it to you. Then an event happened that if we didn't live through it, if you guys didn't live through it, you've at least heard about it. It was the energy crisis of the 1970s. Really high energy prices, increasing demand, and reduced supply. So the Public Utility Regulatory Policies Act of 1978 was created in response to the energy crisis. It was meant to promote energy conservation, reduce demand, and promote greater use of domestic energy and renewable energy, increase supply. The hope was we reduce prices and um, allow customers to use less energy. But what it did and it impacted the electric utilities the most was it required the investor-owned utilities, IOUs, to purchase electric power generated by independent power producers. Um, there were qualifying facilities. So basically they had to have certain, meet certain qualifications and the electric utilities were to require to purchase power from them. In addition, we we're required to provide backup power to those facilities. So all of that seems well and good, right? Trying to do the right thing. We're trying to get customers to reduce energy consumption. We're trying to get some homegrown um, generation, some clean power generation to increase supply. But then what happened? They went one step too far. So right, PURPA gave the states the ability to implement FERC's rules that we mentioned on the previous page. And what did New York State do? New York State implemented the six cent law. Now, it's very funny because if you're working on something in the electric utility um, and they think that they may go, be going a bit too far in implementing something that might be unsustainable in the long term or might have too much of a cross subsidy, everyone will go, remember the six cent law? So this is an important aspect to remember and we'll loop back around to this when we start talking about net metering. 
So what they did is the Public Service Commission could order utilities, which they did, to enter into contracts with power producers and could also require the utilities to purchase electricity at a minimum rate of six cents per kilowatt hour, kilowatt hour even if that six cents was greater than their avoided costs. So if they were able to purchase energy at less than six cents or generate it at that point, we own generation, or generate it at six cents, we were still required to sign these contracts with um, individual power producers. The theory was the rising cost of oil and the high construction costs of nuclear power plants would make the six cents per kilowatt hour a bargain. But that's not at all what happened. Following few prices, technological advances, and successful energy efficiency investments created a surplus of generation. So that kept the cost of electricity well below six cents. Consumers were paying more than they should have in an open market. So the six cent law created a, a substantial subsidy for the qualifying facilities for the IPPs. So in 1992, New York State, with both the support of the electric utilities and the qualifying facilities, repealed the six-cent law, but on a going-forward basis. So the utilities were still stuck with these very high-cost contracts for a large amount of energy. So we were allowed to actually buy out these high-cost contracts. We had to do a cost-benefit as well as the qualifying facility as to whether it was more beneficial to buy out the contracts or continue the contracts. It had a lot to do with how they were, what the other parameters on the contracts were. Um, so all the New York State utilities bought out a lot of these six cent contracts, which left us with a large payment, better known as stranded cost payment that were due. And why do I go so into so much detail about this aspect, this six cent law? Well, because we don't want history to repeat itself. Right When there's enthusiasm to stimulate technology and it's priced inappropriately, it can develop something that's not sustainable, the six cent law. The six cent law was not sustainable. It was recognized and it was repealed. Today's six cent law is net metering. We're gonna talk about, about this later, but it's one of the issues that I'm fairly passionate about. Again, <laughs> it's the six cent law for those consumers that cannot take advantage of distributed generation and don't get the benefit of net metering they're subsidizing those customers that can. And like I said, we're going to talk a bit about that coming up. So I'd like to talk about a few more things in the industry that I think is important that you at least know is, is out there. One is the Energy Policy Act of 1992, which created exempt wholesale generators. Wholesale, a wholesale generator is a generator of energy for sale exclusively to competing wholesale customers, right? Not end use retail customers, and who is exempt from some of the requirements of the PUCA Act of 1935. So it allowed to sell and generate power at the wholesale level. Um, granted FERC the authority to order the entity owning the transmission lines to allow power producers to use those transmission lines for wholesale electricity sales. So if a um, public utility, let's just, just say Niagara Mohawk, was the owner of the transmission line, a generator to the west wanted to transmit energy to the east, we had to open up our transmission lines to allow them to transmit the energy to a wholesale customer across our lines. A few more additional orders that are important, and, the, and Wes will definitely go into these in much more detail. They touch his part of the world much more than, than mine. In 1996, for, in 1996, FERC orders 888 and 889, which is basically open access to the nation's grid. 1997, New York State ordered unbundling, which is the divestiture of generation from New York State investor-owned utilities. So. New York State utilities do not own generation anymore. And we're going to talk about this, I believe, in Module 5 when we start to talk about the utility bill and how money um, flows back and forth when we talk about competitive energy marketers and where they, get, where they get their supply from. And in 1998, FERC authorizes the establishment of the NISO. So what does the industry look like today? Well, there's 3,000 public, private, and co-op electric utilities, 1,000 independent power producers, three regional synchronized power grids, one in the east, one in the west, and Texas. And a regionalized synchronized power grid is electrically tied together during normal system conditions and, oper and operate in a synchronized um, frequency. 
We have eight re electric reliability councils. We are overseen by the Northeast Power Coordinating Council. And what they're responsible for is promoting and improving the reliability of the international interconnected bulk power system. And we have 150 control area operators of which the NISO is one. And control area operators, Wes is gonna get into much more detail about. So let's start to talk about whether electricity is a product or whether it's a service. And when I talk about electricity, we're gonna break it into two components, the delivery portion of the bill and the commodity portion of the bill. Remember I said in 1997, um, New York State was required to divest of all of its generating stations. At the same time, we were required to unbundle those prices. Um, before that, they were all combined together as one bundled price. You paid a certain per kWh rate, um, and that included the delivery and the commodity. We were required to unbundle that, and now it's further unbin unbundled on the bill. So the bill display itself has the delivery component separate from the commodity component. Um, thereby, if a customer wants to do some price comparisons with competitive marketers, all of the commodity components that they would no longer pay if they got the commodity from the utility would be in that portion of the bill and they can easily compare. So let's talk about whether we believe electricity is a product or a service. As on the previous page, I think it needs to be broken into two pieces, the delivery component and the commodity component. And I compare this to UPS. UPS delivers products right? So they deliver it from manufacturers or stores to the end consumer. They're the delivery. They provide a service. I view us as delivering commodity, the electric utilities, as delivering the commodity, whether it be the electricity or the gas, which is the product. Now, we've mentioned before that the electric utility industry is regulated, and our regulator, regulator here in New York State is the New York State Public Service Commission. But why is an electric utility regulated? Well, the electric delivery is considered to be a natural monopoly, right? It provides an essential service for the well-being of society. The technical and economic features of the industry dictate that a single provider is best able to serve the overall demand at a lower cost than multiple entities. Just think about it. If there are multiple electric utilities within your neighborhood and you had multiple electric distribution companies servicing you, you had multiple sets of distribution lines crisscrossing your neighborhood, you had multiple meter readers, multiple servicemen, imagine how costly and how confusing that would be. So as we said, it has been determined that the electric utility distribution business, that a single provider is best able to serve the overall demand at a lower cost than multiple entities. So regulation comes into play because regulation replaces competition as a determinant of prices. Regulators are the ones that allow us to charge the prices that we charge. And there's both federal and state regulation. Federal, regular, federal regulators regulate interstate transmission and wholesale power sales across state lines. State regulators, um, they regulate the retail rates and the distribution services within the state boundary. So I wanna introduce you to the New York State Public Service Commission. The first bullet is very important. Their primary mission, ensure safe, secure, and reliable access to the electric, gas, steam, telecommunications, and water services for New York State's residential and business consumers, consumers at just and reasonable rates. Safe, secure, and reliable access at just and reasonable rates. In addition, they oversee the siting of major electric and gas transmission lines and facilities, ensure the safety of natural gas and liquid petroleum pipelines. They seek to stimulate innovation, strategic infrastructure investment, consumer awareness, competitive markets where feasible, and we'll talk about that as we get towards the rev proceeding, and the use of resources in an efficient and environmentally sound manner. Commissioners are appointed by the governor and confirmed by the New York State Senate for a term of six years or to complete an unexpired term. So commissioners are appointed by the governor. So commissioners have their own agenda, both political and personal. We'll see this as we go through um, some of the modules. Each board of commissioners is not the same. So depending upon when you go in front of the commission, you may get different answers. 
um, around the fringes, that is. So what are the regulator's responsibilities? They're there to protect the customer. They're there to oversee the operations of the utility and approve prices, right? So they determine our revenue requirement. There's a whole module on talking about how a utility determines a revenue requirement. Cost allocations among customers. How do those costs get spread amongst the different service classes? They approve design of pricing structures and level of prices. Prices must be prices that are set must collect the revenue requirement for the utility and provide appropriate price signals for customers. They determine service quality standards and consumer protection requirements. They oversee financial they oversee the financial responsibility of the utility. They review and approve capital investments and long-term planning. They assure compliance with regulations and tariffs. So I just wanted to give you a quick overview of the organization of the New York State Public Service Commission. As I mentioned before, they're appointed commissioners, and there's usually three to five of them, and they have a professional staff. And you'll see a multitude of different departments on here. Um, generally, we work with the staff. Um, they report up through their executive staff who report up through the commission, the, the commissioners themselves, who has a, a chairperson. Currently, it's Audrey Zebelman is the chairwoman. Um, they're the ultimate decision makers, but they have a whole host of staff that works for them, and that's who we work with. I'm not going to go through all of these departments. It's here for you to see. It's also up on the New York State Public Service Commission's website. So what I'd like to do in the next couple of slides is to talk about the industry participants, both from a traditional perspective as we see it today. And in the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about what the changes may be coming up in the near future. So in a vertically integrated utility, you've got generation, transmission lines, distribution lines, all the way to the retail meter. A vertically integrated utility would own all pieces of that. And like I said earlier, in New York State, we don't own the generation. Um, so we're not allowed to own the gen generation. So the supply comes from generators, but not vertically integrated into the utilities mix. Um, so the generators flow through to either competitive energy marketers who contract with our customers, or like I said before, we're the provider of last resort. So if our customer does not go to a competitive energy supplier, they would get the commodity from us and we would procure the energy from the generator. We also have the ability to procure the energy on the open market. That's another area that Wes is going to get into. So on this slide, what I'm showing you is, is somewhat of a look of what we think the future of energy may be. I've mentioned in this module the REV proceeding, and that's an acronym for Reforming the Energy Vision. It's an initiative that was started by the New York State Public Service Commission that's looking at alternative ways um, to provide energy to end use customers. They want clean, local, um, distributed energy resources at the hands of consumers. We're going to talk a lot about this in Module 10, but you can see centralized power, which we just talked about, from generator to transmission, distribution lines, where in the future they're going to be using a lot of renewable power, solar, wind, there's battery storage. There's a lot of technology out there that looking at that is just going to totally disrupt the decent or dis disrupt the centralized power industry. And we're going to talk much more about that in module 10. In the next few slides, I want to make sure that I introduce each of the um, industry participants and describe how the money flows. So the first participant is the New York State Public Service Commission. They're established by New York State Public Service Law. They have approximately a $73 million annual budget recently. Within this, they are within the state budget and they are primarily funded by the New York State Utilities through their rates. The NISO is another not-for-profit organization. They administer the bulk power markets that trade on average $7.5 billion in electricity and related products annually. There are numerous true-ups to ensure that no profit is made by the NISO. So now let's talk about the generators. In states where they can have vertically integrated, where um, utilities are allowed to own generation, they just recover the 
costs and profits within the rates charged to customers. They have bundled rates, which covers both the delivery and the commodity. Um, they also have the ability to sell generation not used by their customers into the market. However, in New York State, where unbundled generators are separate. So the markets they have, and this is a lot also that Wes will talk about, um, there's the NISO day ahead market. So it's a financially binding day ahead market that they've been into. The NISO real time market, which is used to balance the system. The capacity market, the ancillary market, and bilateral transactions. Those are actually contracts between buyers and sellers. They can contract with sellers and not go through the NISO. Everything ultimately goes through the NISO, but the NISO doesn't set those prices. Transmission owners. Transmission owners recover their rates under two different methodologies. One is in their retail rates. They charge, they get the cost and allow a rate of return right from their retail customers and it's in the retail rates. They also recover a portion of the cost with a profit through the wholesale market, right? The wholesale market is open to anyone after securing the necessary approvals, can generate power, connect to the grid, and find a counterparty willing to buy their output. We had talked about that before, that we have to open up our transmission lines for that transaction to occur. Competitive suppliers and marketers affiliated with utilities pay the open access charge, the wholesale market rate. Independent power producers that are not affiliated with the utility want to use the lines, have to pay um, the cost of the transmission lines. Excess generation sold by traditional vertically integrated utilities. Federal Energy Regulatory Commission regulates the rates charged by transmission owners. So on the retail side, the first bullet, that is all baked into the per kWh or per kW rate that we charge our retail customers. On the other portion, that's opened up to anybody that wants to use our transmission lines. Those rates, because they cross state lines, it's a transaction that cross state lines, is regulated by FERC. And so that's a whole different rate proceeding when we set the wholesale transmission rates. Regulated distribution utilities. Those are, their costs are recovered through their retail rates that are charged to end use customers regulated by the state's commission. We have a whole section that we'll be talking at length of how utilities recover their retail rates. Then there's commodity providers. In New York State, we have um, energy service companies. Um, they contract directly with customers. Their rates are not regulated by New York State's commissions. They provide electricity or the gas commodity. Um, and they may provide value added services things like fixed rates, um, green power, electricity generated from renewable resources such as wind, solar, and hydro, furnace repair, or maintenance service. So um, commodity providers. Some additional commodity providers. I mentioned earlier that the utilities are the providers of last resort. So the utility is required to provide commodity if a customer has not chosen another provider. We're the provider of last resort. In New York State, a utility cannot make money on commodity sales and is protected from losing money on commodity sales. So each New York State utility has a commodity true up where we reconcile um, actual commodity expense, to actual, actual commodity revenue. So we don't make money and we don't lose money on the commodity. Then there's direct customers of the NISO. So these are very large customers. They must have a peak connected load of a megawatt at a single service point, and they actually schedule and purchase electricity right through the NISO for their own consumption, not for resale. Another commodity provider we're going to talk about is the New York Power Authority. The New York Power Authority, NIPA, um, is the nation's largest state power, public power uh, organization. It provides some of the lowest cost electricity in the nation, operating 16 generating facilities and more than 1,400 circuit miles of transmission lines. It provides electricity to 51 municipal and cooperative electric systems to sell to their customers. You'll hear a lot about munis in New York State um, and how low cost their power is. And, and you'll talk about other, uh, other municipalities saying, why can't we have low cost power too? But NIPA only has so much power, and these contracts to the original municipalities are, are quite long in length. 
They also provide electricity to several upstate New York investor-owned utilities for resale without markup to their customers. So we actually have in our tariff a separate NIPA tariff. So they get the low, we have to transmit and provide to them electricity from the NIPA hydro power plants. And so they get a much reduced price of just the commodity. They pay the full delivery component. NIPA uses no tax dollars and incurs no state debt. It finances it through the projects, principally through the sale of bonds. The bonds are repaid and the projects uh, operated using revenues from operations. So <clears throat> those are the commodity providers. And the last industry participant I wanna talk about is the customer. The customer can either be a full service customer of the utility or can be a delivery only customer. If it's a full service customer, they pay the utility for both the delivery and the supply itself, the actual commodity, the electricity or the gas. If they're delivery only, they pay the delivery to the utility and the supply to a competitive supplier, to an ESCO. There are various service classes within the electric utility industry. Um, Customers are grouped into service classes based on similar characteristics and usage patterns. And their rates are different, and the, the, the way that they're charged are different. We have a unit that's going to talk specifically about this. But the general classes that you'll see common across utilities are residential, low-income, small commercial, large commercial, and industrial. Standby rates, which we're going to talk about, those are customers that have some sort of distributed generation but are still connected to the grid. So we're still here as backup service or supplemental service for them. And we also have an outdoor lighting tariff. And so the flow of dollars would be different from all of those classes. So that's the end of module one. I've tried to introduce you to the industry and how we got to where we are today and all of the industry participants. Thank you.